with baseball still locked out, we talk about other shit. Diamond Diehards <laughs> is on. <laughs> Joe Rizzo here bringing you baseball and other shit along with the dog, Jeff Healy. He wasn't expecting that opening, and neither was I. But nevertheless, we persisted. Thank you for joining us on the live stream for a Monday, Martin Luther King Day, January 17th, 2022. We have, we have made it. We have made it to the... Uh, to the to the first uh, milestone here of uh, of the new year, and no milestones to report on baseball, so we're gonna hurry up and try to do this before the Monday Night Wild Card game starts, <laughs> and we're gonna kick it off uh, in a mere moment here with uh, with the dog doing veteran of the day. But first, follow us everywhere on social media at Diamond Diehards. Uh, that's from Twitter, Facebook. There's a fa- great Facebook group where we're streaming right now if you're watching that. And uh, various other places on social media. We are Diamond Diehards. You can follow the dog on Twitter at Jeff Healy 8 That's the number eight. Otherwise, the uh, the Diamond Diehard stuff, usually I'm operating, but dog has, uh, has a good view into that. So if you want to get a hold of us, do it that way. If you like to uh, to support the podcast the way FMS Graphics Dot com and Big Ed's Car Wash have done, then contact us uh, through there. FMS Graphics is a family-run, family-owned business for the last 50 years. And if you need any, and I mean any, printing and promotional needs, you go to fmsgraphics.com. fmsgraphics.com for all your printing and promotional needs. And the weather, as we'll talk about later... Uh, has gotten crappy here in uh, not just the Northeast, but in a lot of the country. But if you're in the Northeast, in the Bergen County or Passaic County areas of New Jersey, stop by Big Ed's Car Wash. Ed has a long tunnel, and he does everything in the most green manner possible. You can go in, tell him Diamond Die Hard sent you. Big Ed's Car Wash in Fairlawn, New Jersey. And now, right over to the dog for Veteran of the Day. All right, thanks, Riz, for uh, for that uh, that fun intro and uh, fun uh, opening to the show here. Uh, our veteran of the day is uh, Winsome Sears. She served uh, as a Marine in the United States Marine Corps, 1983 to 1986, as an electrician. Uh, however, she's more popularly known as being elected uh, Virginia Lieutenant Governor in November 2021. She was the first woman of color ever elected to statewide office in the state of Virginia and the first woman lieutenant governor in Virginia history as well. So 42 uh, lieutenant governors, she's the 42nd, and uh, the first woman governor and first woman of color ever elected to statewide office. So our veteran day is lieutenant governor and for, and uh, always Marine, once Marine, always Marine, right? Uh, and Marine, Winsome, Sale, uh, Winsome Sears of uh, Virginia. Okay, so baseball's locked out. We're gonna talk about other shit. Dog, <laughs> we, our chat, the Fordham chat was as lively as ever over the weekend. And uh, I'm sitting here kimuraing myself to pat myself on the back because <laughs> I have the record right there. It's, I, I gave my picks against the spread. Five and O oh over the weekend. And uh, as uh, you know, if you're, if you're getting ready for the Rams Arizona game, I'm going Arizona tonight, getting like three and a half. That was the original pick. I'm, I'm sticking with it. But that was a heck of a wild card weekend, huh? Yeah. When are we, when are we getting the uh, the DraftKings sponsorship? It feels like everybody <laughs> else in everybody else in the world is sponsored by DraftKings. So you know, come on. Uh, yeah, great, uh, great, uh, great stuff all around. Real uh, change in the guard too, right? That uh, I thought was kind of neat with like you know Bills, Pats going out there, uh, Mahomes and uh, and Big Ben. Um, so definitely, uh, definitely a fun and exciting time in the, in the NFL and kind of thought this whole year, frankly, in the NFL, uh, really wide open, right? I mean, you'd say probably the Packers are a little bit, uh, a little bit notch above sort of the next, I mean, obviously Tampa Bay, you know, kind of right there as well, but I mean, it just felt coming in like, you know, dude, any of these teams could get hot and just run it. You know, they've, they've each have looked great and they've each looked terrible. Uh, and tonight it's like a classic one of two, two teams like that. With both the Rams and the Cardinals, I mean the Cardinals at times look like there's just no way to stop Kyler Murray, and uh, and they look invincible, and then they go out the next week and you're like, what is going on? 
which is why it's it's hard to like him for a playoff, but uh, you'd hate to play him in a in a single game. I know. We're we're in a double game, whatever that would be. Uh, cards great on the road. They uh, they set the NFL record this season: most road wins by a team with at least one road loss. That's because they went eight and one on the road in the seventeen game season. How about that? You like uh, that? Interesting. You went you went digging for that one. That's, a, that's no. Well, cool. that that's one of those like you could make up a stat to to uh, buttress any argument, right? <laughs> like I mean, that's the one. They went eight and one on the road. Wait, that's that's so. It, think, whoever uh, had gone eight and zero on the road, you know that. Wasn't that what, like the Gi- wasn't the Giants like oh seven? I think it was something like that where they were like six and two on the road or seven and one on the road and then won the. Won them all on the road, obviously, in, in the playoffs. There was something weirdly. It was either 07 or 11. The uh, the Giants had a similar, not not quite to that extreme, but like they were like below 500 at home, but they were just sick on the road and just went uh, went off in the playoffs. I know, but good though. still. They, that, that's, but, that's better for Giant talk in the but playoffs. They didn't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's for when we get Carl Banks on the show, Bob Pop. And Fordham, uh, you know. Bob Pop, who preceded me. In high school and college, by five years, he as he was always going out, I was going in. Ah, oh, that's right. With that, 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 that is a tight, a tight connection. Yeah, they're great I, on the podcast, by the way. Tell a friend, tell a friend. So, I know that's leave, a good. We the Giants. We have to steal. So great. It's so great because you finally get to hear Papa talk the way you know he's dying to talk I on know. the radio. <laughs> and we may or may not have heard him talk Car- like Carl's that. got a little loose too. There's, there's, yeah. there's some. Uh, there's some. Uh, only Daddy uses those words. <laughs> Do they have a bourbon sponsorship? <laughs> <laughs> I think we need one of those too. Exactly. Um, we'll take anything. As uh, as the Olympics are coming up, and nobody cares about them except here comes Diggins. Here comes Diggins. I just had to send that video in there in the uh, in the chat. That was like one of the best Olympic moments ever. But it's really funny. Because that was the cross country skiing. The U.S. in 2018 won their first cross country skiing medal ever and the guy who was back in connecticut like because he wasn't even allowed to be there he just loses his mind and makes like you know he's the he's the analyst and the play-by-play guy's doing his thing but it's like the one time where you actually don't mind the analyst stepping over him because it was just it's like a great call and a great moment and those guys did it from like a studio and and now I feel bad because they're having these Olympics in Beijing and like literally there's zero buzz. Nobody wants to know anything about the Olympics and about, you know, about China and these athletes kind of, you know, get, get screwed and, and, and shush to, shush to the side. And uh, that completes our Olympic talk for uh, diamond Die Hearts this episode. <laughs> um, but the, here comes Diggins is a, you know, Google that and, and, and check that out. But then I found dog, like the quaint, version like the call that's not those two guys it's just one guy and i think he's british and it's just it's like not even a moment like if you hear that call it there's just no moment but if you hear the other call it's like one of the greatest moments in in olympic uh history so that leads us to uh of course tony romer and tony romo and jim nance right at the end of the (laughs) cowboy game where livid so, so like, they nailed the call. I feel like it's a, and they it's really a, did. they yep. did right. Like Romo is just right on top of it. He's saying, "Game's over. The game's over. The game's over." And I don't know. I they, like they get criticized a lot, but like that they were like to me. I'm I'm on those guys for that game. Old school yeah. CBS Niners Cowboys, you know, and and. uh Listen, I mean, is Romo perfect? I don't know if he, you know, he's far from perfect, but like I, I'm entertained by him and I'm not bothered by him. So, and it, listen, I mean, you can't knock that guy's insight. I mean, he's not, does he, does he not let the game breathe a lot of times? Yeah, he does, you know, but what's he supposed to do? Like yeah. sit there he's, and, and he's fun to entertain to listen to him, particularly for, uh, you know, folks who, are, who maybe aren't, you know, as, Hundred percent up on the game, right? So maybe the more casual fan or whatnot. Um, I think he does a, a great job of that. I mean, that was sort of a lot of criticisms you've heard of broadcasts in the past, right? That was always the argument against McCarver uh, with that. But a lot of people grew up, and and he helped bring in and keep a lot of people into the game uh, because of the way that he would express it. So, um, but yeah, it's it it does hold back versus like our our traditional like Vin Scully, let let the moment breathe and stuff like that, and 
and so forth. But you know, there's different uh, different styles for each each person. I, and I I do think he actually did nail the uh, the last part, and he was he was on top of it, and he was correct, right? Yeah. So if he wasn't like screaming like, "Oh, they gotta do this, they gotta do that," I mean, he he nailed exactly what what was happening with it. Yeah, the uh, other games like I so I was in and out, and we'll we'll do it later in uh, Die Hard Dads because I was on the road for the weekend for uh, New Jersey Rockets girls hockey, the uh, the other gig that you know I do, or the other other gig that I do when I'm you know throwing my voice and stuff out there. So I I was a lot of uh, there was like in and out TV. And then there was a lot of radio on Sunday. So I had a little bit of a different perspective for some of the games. And, you know, I was missing like lots of chunks of time. But one thing that we that you were just busting my balls about in our pre-show meeting is what the hell was my obsession with screaming that the Cowboys should be going for two like from the beginning of the game yesterday. So I'll let you start with the grilling. You could set me up. I'm put. I put myself out there. I, you know, you th- you could shoot the arrows at me. But All this right, was so a lively let's... debate between us on uh, on the thread. I was a man yeah. on an island. By the way, this. I was getting a little nervous that like you literally were going to drive off the road as you're trying to do this like t- like talk texting. I I don't know how you even kept along with it. By the way, it was, it was truly <laughs> remarkable. All right, so let me paint the word picture here. So it's thirteen nothing San Francisco, right? So. Things were off to to a rocky start down in uh, down in uh, Texas. Uh, Dallas finally gets it going, goes down, gets a touchdown. So it's thirteen six. So immediately, you're like, all right, it's a two touchdown game, right? So you got your first touchdown, kick the extra point, get another touchdown, and uh, and you're up, right? So we're, we're kind of back into it. So it's thirteen six, and Riz is screaming for Dallas to go for a two point for <laughs> go for a two point conversion. This is like the beginning of the second quarter or something like that. Um, and the, I believe the rationale was you want to change momentum and shake things up. <laughs> to win, I retorted, they just scored the effing touchdown. That is the change in momentum. <laughs> the two-point conversion is like, I don't know. Like, I don't I, know. I, I, okay. I'm not quite sure what that would do other than, like, confuse them perhaps. Here's my rationale, though. Here's my rationale. But, but let's let's hear it. You got to know you gotta know who you're coaching against, right? And if somebody's going to try to out-coach you in a certain way – you just need to be prepared for that. And you know what the 49ers are going to do with a 13 nothing lead. They are going to run the ball down your throat. They are going to take no risky plays. And they are going to kick field goals with Robbie Gold, who is the all-time percentage leader in uh, postseason field goals. He's 18 for 18 all-time. He's never missed a playoff field goal. And yes, dog, he's still kicking. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you know that they're going to kick field goals. You're, up, you're down 13 nothing, right? If you get a touchdown and you've just been able to, you know, move the ball down the field or whatever, it's fine. If you kick the extra point, 13-7, whatever, uh, they're going to kick a field goal like on the next possession and you're going to be down nine. It becomes a two-possession game immediately. So what you want to do in a game, in my opinion, in 2022, now in 2015, would I say this? No. In maybe even a few years ago, I might not have said it. But what they're going to do is they're going to kick a field goal. It's going to be 16-7. It's a two-score game. What I'm trying to establish from the beginning is keep it to a one-score game for as often and as for long as possible. You're playing against a big defense. They're going to try to keep you out of the end zone as much as possible. But So if you keep it to that one-score game, you, you're, you're always in it. You're always in it. And if you start out at 13-6, right? If you go for two and you're at 13-8, they kick it at, they they kick a field goal. You're at 16-8. It's still a one-score game, right? The way we call one-score game. I know if you're just baseball people and you're getting football shoved down your throat, don't worry about it. Just just go with it. We say it's a one-score game when you could get a touchdown and then you have the opportunity to tie the game with your conversion, whether it's the you know kicking it or going for two. That's the simple you know way to put it. So. You're keeping it at a one-score game, even if they score again, and you know that they're going to be basically conservative, you know, pretty much from there on in. Their 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 poll mo: get an early lead, keep their defense, you know, a little bit fresh, get long drives, kick field goals, and if you get a touchdown, you get a touchdown. Great. So to me, you get a touchdown, yeah, that changes the momentum a little bit. If you go for two and you don't make it, it's still 13-6. It's still a one-score game. They kick a field goal, 16-6, and, and that's a common, you know, that common 10-point 10, 10 differential. So you're changing the way 
that they'd play the game and you're also but you're not having to change the way that you play the game and that's what i meant by it and and in a playoff game i don't think it was too early to do it mid you know or late they were pretty late they were fairly late at that point in the second quarter i don't think it was too late you don't know how many times you're going to get the ball the other part that i was critical of and i said this in the thread when the 49ers scored the touchdown to get up 22-7 I was stunned that Kyle Shanahan did not go for two because that's the new school math right there all the way. You go for two, you push that lead from 15 to 17, it's a massive difference. You you have a lead from six from 15 to 16, yeah, it's a little better. Sure, you're forcing the other team to make a couple of twos if they if they score. But the difference, now you start calculating things in this new age of the NFL between how many scores are you up rather than how many points you're up. And to me, that's a great differentiator. You always keep it within the fewest amount of scores because of the way, not just because that's game theory, but it it's because of the way most of the coaches or a majority of the coaches, and especially we'll call them the new age coaches, the Boar Wonders, uh, that's the way they manage. That's the way they that's the way they, they go about the game. That's the way they're setting up their offenses. And you change the way that your offense plays and you could change a little bit the way your defense plays when you're playing a one score game versus a two score game. And in a playoff game, to me, that starts in the second quarter. You're already down two scores in the second quarter. So uh, there was a lot of rationale behind it. I wasn't just spewing stuff out there. I certainly wasn't drinking because I was I was on a four-hour drive home. So um, I, will, I will say I did agree with you actually later on in the game with the San Francisco one on that. And uh, I think to kind of tie in with your uh, your uh, the score differential and taking it from up from 15 to 17. Um, you know the way you look at it, like the two scores versus three scores, right? That gives your if you're San Francisco if you push it to 17. That gives you two intermediate drives, right? So say Dallas scores, say they get a touchdown, they come back. You have a drive where you have the you have the initiative and can run out the clock or burn off as much as you can and, and hurt the Cowboys in that. If they stop you, Dallas gets the ball back, comes back and scores again. You have a second option to go and maintain the initiative and that. So I, that I think is sort of like the key differentiator that if you have three, that means that by implicitly, as long as you don't blow an onside kick or something, you have two different drives for you to either score points or destroy the clock uh, to help win your game. So that basically gives you um, an additional, uh, you know, basically doubling your chance at running the clock out on them, uh, going for it, making them do three versus two. So I do agree with you on that. I will say earlier on, like say Dallas goes and uh, scores and makes it 13-6, goes for two, doesn't get it. I think that, again, kind of t- deflates the sales a little bit in, the, in your home crowd. Um, and gives a little bit of a pump to the Niners. I also don't like the fact you're kind of implicitly assuming that you're giving up another score to the Niners. I just I don't like that mentality. And again, it might be old school on that, but I don't want to play to say like, oh, well, I know they're going to score a field goal, so do this. I, I want to be concerned what I can do and what I'm going to dictate to them. Um, so I think it's a little early for that sort of signaling Um back and forth the only time i could see something like that is like when you when you're playing like the chiefs right and you had and, or the pats back in the day right and you're like i've got to go for touchdowns even though normally i would always go for a field goal like that's the only time where i think it's if it's so tilted like that that you've you know the numbers tell you you absolutely have to go for max points because you're just not going to get that, that many opportunities well i i i don't know if i would agree with you know the same philosophy that i just presented if it's a regular season game but in a playoff game or a do or die game, I, I think you have to turn up the heat right away. Like you can't, it's like a baseball game that's, you know, uh, a game five of a five game series, a game seven of a seven game series, a wild card game. You can't dick around. Like if you if Garrett Cole doesn't have it in the second inning, you got to get him the hell out of the game. Like you can't risk it, right? Even though he's your best, he's your best option. It's a conventional thing. Well, maybe today, it like you just can't afford that extra pitch, that extra mistake. And I think in these games, you know, arcane thinking um, is, you know, the same thinking that, you know, was only a, just a few years ago because the, this newer wave is coming in. And I think a lot of these, you know, coaches that are that are getting jobs, um, they're just doing things a little bit differently. And if you don't adjust to it and you don't figure it out, I mean, you're going to get left behind. Now, what did I just lose the dog? 
I think we lost the dog. So, all right. It's just going to be yours truly rolling in until uh, until the dog gets back. And since we're live, uh, there's no safety net. And my big old mug is uh, going to be on here. So, this happens on occasion, but it's never actually happened during a show. And, um, you know... That's just the way it goes. That's that's when you're when you're going uh, on on wild card weekend, and baseball's locked out, and uh, you know, and now I've locked out the dog. So uh, anyway, a good little stat for you was the dog was a little bit further away from his mic, and his, I guess he's t- telling me his uh, laptop died. He's a little bit further away because the diamond dog was uh, close to his chair, and he didn't want to risk that the wheel of his chair would uh, would touch or run over the diamond dog's leg. We uh, we love the diamond dog. We are a big fan of her in uh, real life and on social media. Anyway, that's all good. Um, there were some blowouts and, and some tight games over the weekend. And like I said, I was patting myself on the back because, well, I got them all right. And I probably should have gone a little bit heavier on uh, on on the betting. Usually, I'm more of like a horse betting guy, so you know I'm not I'm not running uh, so much into the uh, the wagering when it comes to uh, to sports betting. I like big odds, so I go with the horses and stuff like that. It's pretty good. Um, the weekend opened with the Bengals holding on for dear life at the end of the game against the uh, Las Vegas Raiders as we wait for a dog to get into view here. And let's see where is he's he's about to come in. Dog is, uh, let's see, he has repatriated us. He is, (laughs) he has now joined us Uh, dog. We are just Uh, talking about the, um, how the Bengals held off the Raiders at the end. The big play in that game. I mean, among many plays was the whistle, on the touchdown that the that the Bengals got, but really in the end, Derek Carr getting the Raiders right down into scoring range. They needed a touchdown. He gets 29 seconds left. He comes up to the line and he spikes the ball. And in the end, the Raiders give up the ball after the final incompletion with 12 seconds left. So that means that in retrospect, which is tough because you're not out there and you're not in a playoff game and it's not whatever eight degrees or whatever it was in Cincinnati. Um, you know, all these things are happening in real time, but if he doesn't clock it, he gets a whole extra play there and they really would have had as it, as it looks now, plenty of time as long as they were throwing in completions. What you don't know in the moment is what if you throw a completion and you're trying to get a guy in at, you know, the area of the one or two yard line, like a, like a catch and, you know, plunge kind of deal, and he doesn't get in. Then you're going to have to jump up and, you know, maybe clock it again or risk the time is going to run out. So those things you don't really know or account for, but that definitely hurt the Raiders at the end of the game. Yeah, and that, <clears throat> that probably reflects too, like, you know, the coaches, right, the coaching staff, obviously turmoil with Cruden and so forth, that, you know, a young guy who's, who's kind of battling above his, uh, above his class there. Um, trying to, to keep it up. And that's just, you know, again, I, we all sort of screamed on the, on the thread, right? That, you know, clocking right there, you know, didn't need to do it. Um, it's almost a, a, it's almost a default that people go to do that. So I think it, you know, it, it you can justify it from their perspective, but if you take a, a second to analyze it and that's where like the, the great coaching staff and whatnot, like sometimes the coaches will have the guy who's like sort of looking, he's trying to look two plays ahead you know, as we would say with uh, with Wayne, right? Skate where the puck's going. Like, if he's playing ahead on that, he sees the 29 seconds and says, hey, wait a minute. We, we can take three seconds, like, get set at the line, and let's go for, like, a post to the corner or something like that. Something where it's, like, a, a very discreet play. It's going to take five or six seconds, and we'll stop the clock anyway. But it gives us a chance for something good to happen, right? You know, a, a pass interference in the end zone or, or obviously a touchdown or whatnot. So I think um, – I think they just kind of went with the safe way to sort of play it there, and I think they did. They did cost themselves a play, and that that could have been the, the turning point in the game, or could have, could have, could have changed the outcome of the game. I should say. Yeah. It it again. It's still a a big leap, right? 
Yep. Still a big leap to say that like they would have scored a touchdown or whatever with one extra play, but you'd rather have the one extra play. Yeah, just like four the, shots at it, right? You're, you're, yeah, within part, you, you're within range right there. So, Right, just like the Cowboys wanted that extra play, you know, <laughs> which, I mean, how you explain that is, uh, again, I understand what they're trying to do, but to gain, you know, 11 yards and use up 14 seconds. Here's the thing, dog. I'm not even sure of this. So basically, Dak Prescott runs a, a designed um, quarterback draw to try to get inside the 30, basically. And the Cowboys' idea is that they have a better chance from there they could run five verticals, which, is mean, which means they line up five receivers, you know, in a long kind of a traditional uh, empty set yeah. formation. Yeah. And they just run straight. And whoever looks like they're the most open, you're throwing the ball there. So you're not just heaving it up into the air. It's definitely a higher percentage play than a Hail Mary where you're just chucking it up there and hope somebody comes down with it. But it's still not a very high. It's definitely a much higher percentage play, but it's still not a high percentage play. Gives you certainly gives you a little bit of a better shot. So I get what they were trying to do. What I am still wondering right now, dog, is – did they actually get credit for snapping the ball and the last play was the spike? Or did they not even get credit for snapping the ball? Because if they if the last so if he did snap it and he spiked it, that's actually even worse. Right? Because now <laughs> you're talking point. about I actually you, slowed that down. I, I kept going back and forth dragging it because I wanted to see that if he actually did get the snap off. It it appeared to me that they snapped. No, I don't know. I couldn't. You couldn't tell if the whistle went. So that's that's probably the key. He, I'm gonna guess the ump didn't blow the whistle. Like he was backing away when they when the center snapped it. So maybe there was a whistle. Maybe there wasn't. But if it wasn't play, it appeared as if Dak got the ball snapped at like just after the one second, and he he spikes it on zero. It's like I was trying to say. It it, it appeared to me that he snapped it before it was double zero. I, so I whether whether or not that was a legal snap, I haven't heard anyone say on it. But yeah, I don't know. I I mean, I guess we could go on NFL.com and look at the play by play and see if the final play was a spike or incompletion, whatever. Yeah. But I haven't heard anybody else mention it, and I've listened to a lot of the coverage, you know, throughout the day, and we certainly have had like our own discussions about it. And I kind of like I think that he actually got the snap off. I do, That's, and that he took I it and he, and he spiked it. So in that case, like, maybe Kellen Moore's off the hook because, like, instead of spiking it, you know, you got to have the next yeah, but play. The design, pl- the design play was for the spike, though, right? It is, That's but, I mean. Like, you'd, then you'd be asking an awful lot of Dak to all of a sudden say, oh, by the way, yes, let's line up these f- these five vertical play that we have pre-called. But if they know that it's yeah. that it's pre-called, that then they just line up and go. I mean, that would be sick. You do you do the merino, right? You fake, you fake it, then you go back and throw it. Or you just, <laughs> just I mean, see if somebody that, bites on it, right? Just throw it to you know, throw it to Lamb. I mean, just yeah. throw it to any Let's of say, those guys. Even if you get right? a corner who like just looks at like looks in and just looks at it, anticipates that, right? And, like see the Lamb goes flying by him. And, yeah, and then hit him over the top. I mean, but, would they be standing there at the goal line? Like maybe, but maybe not. Like there would I certainly so. be disarray. I, mean, I think they had went to play to tackle them and stuff, right? So I would yeah. say they they probably brought it in. Um, yeah, I, again, I on we talked about it on the thread too that you know I don't. First of all, like uh, McCarthy keeps keep talking about like the play from the fifty. But by the way, the line was at forty. Right? Yeah, Which I know. Huge it was difference. Forty-one. Yeah. It's I mean, it was 41. like it was like just on the other side of the fifty prior. Well, I think what he means is that their playbook calls for anything really outside the 30 that's going to be a Hail Mary, and anything inside is going to be, you know, five wide, just streaks. I I mean, again, I I sort of – I think you get two plays off on there. I think you run your five verticals at the 40. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, that that takes six or seven seconds or something like that. It just – it's – you know what it is? You don't have enough time in that situation, perhaps, to protect the quarterback, and it just ends up being a hail mary anyway. I so I disagree. I think you have enough time. Fourteen seconds. I think you have enough time to go back and throw. If there's a crazy blitz or whatever else, like no, that, I'm not saying total. fourteen seconds. I'm saying time to get the shotgun snap and be in the pocket long enough for your receivers to get to where you could either hit them or not with a catch. I don't think there's enough time that you're going to be able to stand back there. The 
Yeah, I because he's going to get he's going to be under pressure. He's going to have to scramble out. It's going to become a Hail Mary anyway. But at the 30, you know, that's like those guys cover 30 yards in three seconds, you know, as opposed to four where you're standing back there it's a second, in the pocket. Right? He's it's at the a, forty which, versus that, right? So at five seconds, or they've run five no, no, or six. No, no, I'm not talking about seconds. One I'm second. not talking about seconds on the clock. I'm talking about time that he, in the pocket, under pressure or not under pressure, that he has to wait for his receivers to get to the point where he would actually release the ball and throw it to them. So to me, uh, that 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 time I space continuum thing. Is it like I? I think from the forty you got to run a hail mary. I think from the thirty you could run the the you know five wide. I think he I think he could do it there reasonably. Yeah. You know, with the re- either way they you know it, the way that it ended was just. I mean, a they total- were going they were going up. I mean, they did finally play the sidelines, which was a great call out by Romo too. That uh, that basically the Niners were giving them. It was funny. Someone on 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 Twitter was sort of saying like, "Oh, they ran a lousy like two minute drill." I'm like, no, they actually ran a great two minute. I I know. Got yeah, to the two minute drill like, was great. Like, there was almost textbook on there, and the Niners just like, "Oh, watch good, just let yourself go out of bounds." I'm like they're giving them like 15 yards, like with every 10 seconds. So they should have had no shot, and they had. I mean, at the 40 or 41 with 14 seconds, they had a legit shot. How about the four, uh, dude? Well, by the way, the hook and ladder to my favorite play in football. Oh, that was that situation. <laughs> But I love it, can we say can we when it was when the Niners had third and fifteen? Can we say what I posted in in the in the Fordham text thread when uh, they had third and fifteen sure. before the last drive? What did you I said what, it all. what did what did I, what situation did I present that that could happen? I don't remember. You don't have to actually. <laughs> what I, so it's third and fifteen. They're tra- they're in like you know with there's like one twenty oh, left. What was it again? No, I said, what happens if they get to fourth and inches? Do they go for it? Or, oh, yeah, yeah, when, when they have the time. Yeah, what do they do yeah. if they get to fourth and inches? Do they go for it, yes. or do oh, they I'm punt? sorry, from the Niner, yes, 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 from the Niner one, yes. And you, like, called it spot on. How yeah. about that? And he gets the first down, and then they review it, and it's fourth and inches. Yeah. I said, what did I say? Okay, Sarah says I said fourth and one. It goes in the books as fourth and one, right? Yeah. It's under. So... How, how sick of a call is that? Nobody was thinking about that. <laughs> that and then I kept, say, I kept texting stuff in the thread that like Tony Romo would say five seconds after. I thought that, that was true. impressive too. Yeah, Debbie yeah. Rizzo loves when I do that. I do that all throughout all games and all sports all the time. That's I, why I, you should listen to this podcast. <laughs> we do this on this podcast too. We tell you shit in April like, hey, Anthony Rizzo is going to end up on the Yankees. You watch. And everyone's like, what? Who? What? Yeah. We kept up. <laughs> It. Yeah, I get uh, the same. Only I'm sitting there explaining to uh, to the cat uh, what's going on in the game and who's this and who's that, and it still counts. Else. So it's it's a little hard. It counts. <laughs> it counts. It's By like, the way, like, when you it's like it's like I'm doing the uh, it's like I'm doing like the Spanish language telecast at like the same time. I'm yeah, the D the D O G button instead yeah. of the yeah. SAP button. <laughs> exactly. Um, even though I know you spell D A W G or we spell it like that for you. Yeah, exactly. Um. What uh I don't know, we're looking already missed the game, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we're starting to Rumble miss the too. here. Yeah, we got it, we got it, yeah, we got it, we got it, we got it. We got it. Speed this up. Um so okay, so we're gonna we'll do the quick cruise, baseball right? stuff. Uh Rachel yeah, Balkovic yeah. got named the Yankees Lowy manager for the Tampa Tarpons, and Great she's the first uh person of the female persuasion to be hired in that capacity in uh, professional baseball as, um, you know, as it pertains to the major league. So that's pretty good. I mean, she's, you know, we, I've, I've followed her, uh, you know, for a few years here on Twitter and she's been, you know, in that, in that hitting community that dog and I really like to follow about, you know, some of the old school stuff and, you know, with the women in baseball and stuff. Uh, Mike Sarah wants her to manage the Yankees and, and fire Boone. Uh, give it a year or two, Mike, you might, uh, you might have it there, but she's on track to be, the first woman manager, right, of the majors. Yeah, if she starts, keeps gotta up. start somewhere, right? That's and uh, you know, start. she's very well respected. Um, Yanks signed Roderick Arias, and the Nats grab uh, Christian Vaquero. Those are international signings, and dog, those are allowed to happen despite the lockout. Yeah, so it gives us gives us something to talk about in there. Good, uh, good job by the Yanks. They were they were uh, they were hunting that guy for a while, so uh, it's good for them to to bring that in. Um, Soto's brother, I think, went to uh, went to the Nats too, right? 
Yeah, I think he's only he 15, was, though, was, so I was dubious about that. Yeah, like, yeah, how is he allowed to sign at 15? I thought you had to be 16 or now 18. I don't know. Yeah, so I was a little I, I was a little. Curious. I haven't kept up with the international rules, to be honest. They, uh, they changed too quick for me. Um, I mean, listen. After, I, he was, after he was posted in the Mets uh, gear, too, so that kind of hurt a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, like, what's the downside? To, what's the downside to signing that guy? Like the way these teams burn money, yeah. just freaking sign him. Like, what the hell? Yeah, exactly. Well, that's like I was all set for it. But, oh well. And you know, because a good job by the Nats over there. Uh, the Sunday night booth at ESPN. David Cohn joins it as a regular, and you know, we we get spoiled by being able to watch him um, on the Yes Network. And he's very good. I to me, he like doesn't do enough games. You know, like I want him there yeah. all the time. He's very insightful, and he's one of those guys, dog, that has the uh, the analytics stuff with the old school stuff balanced out pretty well. Like he he makes good presentations of when you could use analytics effectively versus you know when it, it it's kind of maybe something like to throw out the window, right? Yep. Yeah, he did. he has a very nice mix of uh, of that. So. Good and how about the uh, the alternate, you know, the which the Manning cast, which we're trying to hurry this up so we could go watch that in the football game, but the uh, the the MLB ESPN Sunday night game is going to have their own sort of like little Manning cast alternate uh, alternate view, right? Yeah, with uh, with um, A Rod and uh, and K on there with uh, with Coney. That's uh, that's solid. So we were talking about our dream team of uh, of Beltran and uh, A Rod doing the. Uh, Doing the baseball Manning cast. Yeah, I don't know, but Beltran might be—he might be in somebody else's dugout really soon. Who That's knows? True. We don't true, really know. True enough on that. Although, if it hasn't happened yet, I'm still dubious as to when it will happen. You know, the other guys—the other guys paid their uh, paid their time, paid their you know fine, so to speak, and and now you know they're they're back in and back in managerial. And he kind seat. of wants to jump in too, which is tough, right? I mean, it's like. He doesn't want to like coach in the minor. Like he'd be a no-brainer for anybody. Like you know, you're as a coach or a, you know, AAA manager or something like that. And he basically wants to stroll in and get it. I'm sure he could do the job. Uh, he obviously, could get that one offer with the Mets. Um, but you know, I think it's tough to line up those situations, right? Where you just like, you know, I get to stroll in and I get to be the manager. Right? That's that's a little tough to sell for the rest of your organization. Yeah. So we as. Uh... As parents, we like to teach our kids, you know, put in the work, do your time. You don't get to cut to the front of the line. And, of course, that leads us to our final segment of Die Hard Dads. How about that, dog? Was that a good transition or what? That was good. That was good. Try and guess the kickoff. <laughs> yeah, we're speeding along here. We're speeding along. Uh, I think we missed the kickoff, but that's yeah, okay. A bit. <laughs> okay. So it's mine sort of goes back a little bit to the uh to the to the first segment where we were talking about, you know, one of the games we did not talk about was the Bills game. The Bills and the Patriots, where I missed that game, although I was not far from Buffalo because I was out in um Oswego, New York and Fulton, New York, which is right on uh right on Lake Ontario up there, and it was below zero Fahrenheit, which is way below zero Celsius. And uh, the Rockets girls went up there for a tournament. Uh, it was a fun weekend. You know, on the ice, they didn't get the results they were looking for. But off the ice, a good time was had by the girls in these times of COVID. They really haven't, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the travel situations and any of the sports, a lot of it has been very limited. But especially for hockey, it seems like the outbreaks over the past couple of years have happened, like, right when their tournaments have been scheduled. So they've had very little of that, and they got a chance to hang together in a place that was – far, far away, and um, it was a good, fun time that was up there. But what the funny thing was is, like, we're, you know, the parents are drinking in the lobby, and the Bills game is, like, kind of going on, and it's just a total blowout. And I think by the time we were back there, the game was was close to over or over. And, you know, you see people, the, the hotel we were at had a good restaurant and bar. And, and us, you would never know this, in Oswego, New York, and all the parts, like, between there and Syracuse, the, it's there, there's a sports bar everywhere. It is like great sports country up there. Like it doesn't matter if they're if it's like college, you know, amateurs, pros. Those people are on top of their shit. And I met a guy named Pops, and um, we were having we got there on Friday afternoon, and 
we uh, go into the restaurant slash bar in the hotel to grab something to eat because we got there about like four o'clock or something like that. And our game wasn't going to be till like eight o'clock or eight thirty that night. So, uh, you know, me and, and Debbie Rizzo and a couple of the other moms were there and, you know, we got some food and there's a guy drinking at a bar and, and, and it's Pops. And it's exactly like when you think of like a Pops, it's exactly who you would imagine. He's at the bar. It's his local bar. He's wearing a baseball cap that says Pops on it, which means he's a family man. Is he a Stargell? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He's kind of like Willie Stargell. He's like Whitey Stargell, maybe. And because uh, he looked more like Whitey Herzog than Willie Stargell. So um, he's, he's obviously like, you know, loved by his family. If he's, you know, if they're making him a hat that says Pops, I'm like, are you Pops? And And he, and he comes over later. He goes, I'm sorry if it looked like I was staring at, you know, over at you and and uh, the people that you're with, but I was just watching the football game that was above you, and it was the Dwight Clark the catch game that they were playing oh. on. And so we were, I was watching it another one, and then so pops engages me, and we start talking about football and football history and all this other stuff. I'm like, I'm like pops is the man. So uh, shout out to pops and Oswego, New York. If uh, you know. I, I don't think I got a chance to tell him about Diamond Diehards because that might have been a little bit uh, too much to handle. But he did have uh, <laughs> one of his sons was a contractor in Afghanistan for like 11 years. So doing doing good work over there. Uh, I don't know if he was actually military, but, you know, what do they call it, dog? Paramilitary or whatever? Like military. Oh, military support. contractors. Military yeah, so contractors. So, yeah. yeah so he had, uh, he had somebody yeah. in, you know, but, but a son doing that and. You know, that was kind of interesting. And, of course, I got to do my live streams of the Rockets games. And, uh, you know, the girls were uh, losers in, in, in four out of four. You know, tightened it up a little bit as, as they went along. But, man, there was some home cooking by the refs. Uh, for the I think because we had New Jersey, the New Jersey designation. Like, you know, they were – I don't know if they were out to get us, but it sure felt like they were. And uh, I was going all Homer, dog. I was making it sound like war crimes. I was being... hearing a couple of my couple, yeah. like, oh, boy. I, I was making it sound like war crimes. <laughs> they being... finally going to call something. <laughs> committed against the Rockets. Just let them skate. <laughs> yeah, just let them go. I mean, like, it was, but, you know, it, it was fine. And um, it was so freaking cold up there. It was great. I, I, I like to get a little taste of that. Co- I mean, you know. I don't have to live in it, you know, here, if it gets below zero, it's once every blue moon, right? Like four years or so, it'll actually get below zero there. It was like a solid, you know, minus two. And I'm walking back and forth between the hotels and the hoodie like this. Like, you know, I'm not outside for that long. It's not going to kill me. And, uh, you know, you got to suck it in and, and, and take it all in. So it was a good, it was a good diehard dad's weekend. It's, you know, you know me, I'm like such a homebody. Like we live not like exactly next door to each other, but it's like, even we don't get together as much as we should just to have a couple of pops or even do the stupid podcast that we're doing here. But, uh, nonetheless, it's good to like hang out. We have such a good parent group over there and, uh, the girls are just excellent. They're just really good girls in terms of like their demeanor, their friendliness, they work hard, they play hockey and, you know, they're accepting of, of new people into their realm, which, you know, hockey could sometimes be a little bit rough or any any sport could be a little bit rough like that. Sometimes you're coming in new. There's so, sometimes there's big gaps in in skill Teenage levels and dynamic they, going to. Uh, right, yeah. And there's just not there's right? there's, there's just there's just very little or none of that that re- that really goes on. So compliments to to the girls and their parents and, and our coaches. Um Jeremy Jacobus, Paul Landstrom, and Bob Connolly really just doing a great job and making things fun. And uh, I'm going to give Gavin Handworker a shout out because uh, he's he doesn't get cold, uh, and he's just was in a t-shirt the whole time. It was below zero, and he was in the t- he was in the t-shirt. He was working the penalty box, and the refs in two or three different games came over and said, "You can't be in here." He's like, "Why? I got I have all my certifications. Like I'm allowed to be in here. I'm safe sport. You know, I'm even a." A coach and they're like no because you're making us feel cold because you're in there with a t-shirt on this is ridiculous <laughs> so you know that was good that was like a little comic relief for for us over the weekend and uh now for for uh dog's gonna switch it up on on his diehard dads i think with a little <laughs> different story oh yeah so we're uh so we're we're experiencing uh katie uh, is transferred to pace so she's uh she's going downtown uh new york she's doing uh 
I guess film and cinema studies or something like that. Can be a screenwriter and producer, I guess director and producer someday or whatnot. So, um, so now, long story short, so now we're looking for an apartment. So she's just she's the first semester in spring. So now we're looking for her apartment. Now, now you know, mind you, with COVID, whatever, it's like it's been knocked down. It's like that. Oh, let me tell you, it is right back to the insanity of the apartments because now, like. All the COVID things are coming off, so everyone's everyone's gonna move back in, right? Like everyone's gonna be going back to the office. Uh, even like Omicron hasn't like slowed things down really, on this. So it's like you, you're trying to work by with. I felt like I'm going back with the Iraqis, where you're trying to work by with and through them to kind of you know teach them how to do it rather than just do it from and so forth. And uh, let's just say it has been a challenge to <laughs> to, deal, to deal with that to try and try and mentor our way through the process, and it's like. You know, apartments are just going like left, right, and center. Like, you know, we had one, it was like, oh, it looked good. And then, you know, boom, it was gone. Like, we go to apply and like do another one, gone, 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 gone. So, so we'll see. We're still, we're still working at this point. And it seems like we have a pretty good broker at this point who I think uh, hopefully we can help uh, bring it across here. But uh, it has definitely been a challenge. And, uh, and uh, I, I'll somewhat say a bonding experience. And we've, we've had our, we've had our ups, we've had our downs and stuff on it. And I think, been able to kind of work it through and like we're still talking to each other and stuff so i think that's a pretty good sign <laughs> uh going through it you know it's, it's definitely a high stress thing like you know you need you need the place and you want to get the right sort of place and you know hopefully the cost isn't off the chart um so uh so yeah so we've, uh, we've had that so she's she's run right into the teeth of trying to uh trying to handle that and it's like oh no we'll call me back and they're being you know unprofessional and this that whatever and it's it's a good growing experience so it's like you know well welcome to the real world like this is kind of what happens on it and you know you're trying to follow up on somebody and they're not going to your back and they gave it to somebody else i'm like unfortunately that's just the way of the world my uh, my my daughter so welcome uh, so we'll welcome see. to the welcome to the real world intern katie mm -hmm. uh for the low low price of one well-produced well-constructed diamond diehards TikTok per week you can live free rent free at your room at home <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, well that would be a challenge. That, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the Diamond Cat would be a huge fan of that for the next four months either. <laughs> Let's say the, the cost ain't free. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right, that's gonna wrap it up for uh, for us over here. As Dog and I are desperate to get uh, get this thing in the books and jump on the the Manning Cast to to watch the Rams versus Cards. By the way, I gave my pick. Did you give yours? Uh, I did not. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna go Cardinals for uh, for our boy Boomer. You going Over outright, or is that, you going outright, or is that with the plus three and a half? Uh, I'm gonna go outright. Yeah, I'm go. I'm actually going outright too. Like what? Yeah. But I would like hedge it. I would do like half outright, half with the spread. So this way, you know, I would get a higher a higher bang for the buck. And if they lost but didn't cover, then uh, you know, I mean, if they lost but still covered, then I could, you know live with that I, back, I do my own version of this but i i, I, I do think, my I own gonna take them. i do my own version of that in, in the horse racing races a lot i kind of like do a little halvesy over here and then if yeah. i hit the bomb it's good and if not i still get a little you know something else to pay for it but that's going to wrap it up follow the dog at jeff healy eight that's the number eight follow me at diamond diehards on twitter and at diamond diehards basically everywhere else if you are watching on the live stream on Facebook. We appreciate it. And if not, then go to facebook.com slash group slash diamond diehards and you could jump on there and uh, just check us out anywhere, anywhere on social media, including LinkedIn, where we are diamond diehards. And if you'd like to do some business with us, the way fmsgraphics.com now in the third calendar year of doing biz with us and the second year for big ed's car wash in fairlawn new jersey give us a shout out anywhere we're working on some good things for you as we always are maybe a couple of guests in our near future but for now we wrap it up as we have awaited once again baseball to com conclude its lockout maybe it's in the offing probably not by the next episode so in the meantime it's the dog and i talking about other shit for the dog jeff healy this is joe rizzo Diamond Diehards is out.